The inspiration came from the late Tony Sale. Um, it was his idea. He conceived of it and he was one of the main energetic enablers who created the museum. The original roots of the museum arose at the Science Museum. I was curator of computing at that stage and the Science Museum has some wonderful old historic iconic computing machines which had long since stopped working. And um, for a new exhibition, which was scheduled to open in 1991, I was concerned to have these machines in working order so that we could demonstrate them to the public. I needed the expertise to do that. And one of the people that I attracted was Tony Sale. Tony knocked on my door and came and said, um, I was at your presentation and you pushed all my buttons. I want to come and work with you. The funding for that project ended and Tony was still massively motivated to continue this work and moved his attention to Bletchley Park. So the inspiration for the museum came from Tony who wanted to carry on the work that had started with the Computer Conservation Society and create a permanent home for the heritage and history of computing that would include one of its signature features was working machines. That would be machines that could be demonstrated live to the public and could see the practices, the sound, the smell, the noise, and the physical size of these old machines. Tony first did his first exhibition in 1994, which was on uh, code breaking at Bletchley Park. And um, he funded it from his own pocket. He and his wife, Margaret, actually financed the, the first exhibition uh, themselves. Um, and the idea of the museum grew, grew slowly. So it, it wasn't as though um, it, it was conceived of fully formed. It was not formed at all. It grew slowly. The funding was hand to mouth. The idea of a, of a, of a more general museum, not just a museum for code breaking, grew um, from the early days from 94 onwards. So um, the, the, when it officially opened, the first exhibition was 1994, but at that stage it wasn't formalized as the, museum of, the National Museum of Computing. That, if you like, became formally known um, in 2007, but the um, activities, the scale of the activities, the extent of the activities, the exhibitions and the collections grew progressively from 94 onwards until it became recognizable as a museum and was formalized and was founded formally in that form. Uh, the answer is donations. People cared enough about machines to want them to be preserved and um, the National Museum of Computing became the institution that became identified with where you take machines of that kind. So they were practitioners, they were designers, they were users, programmers, people who serviced these machines. When they started going, uh, being decommissioned, that is being taken out of service, they were attached to these machines. They saw them as personally significant. They saw them as historically significant. And they inevitably approached uh, TNMOC, they approached the museum to find a home to preserve these in perpetuity. So almost without exception, the archives, the documents, the devices, the equipment, the large machines, the small machines were donated by individuals, by corporations, by companies, um, by people active in information technology who were concerned to preserve the heritage of their own field. These were machines that did not survive, but were legendary and had mythical significance in the histories. One is Colossus, another one is the Bletchley bomb, again used for decryption. And currently almost complete is the EDSAC, which is a hugely significant machine, completed 1949, 1950, originally at Cambridge. None of these machines survived in their entirety, and some of them didn't survive in any form at all. And while the expertise is still current, and while there were still the original designers, almost not entirely available to speak to, um, these machines, there was only a small window in which these machines could be rebuilt with any um, conviction of their authenticity.